I speak in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. During seminary, each seminarian serves at a parish for two years. I work at a small parish in San Francisco called St. John the Evangelist. It was located in a destitute neighborhood in the heart of the city. And there was one sermon I won't forget the rector preached. It's about our relationship to wealth as a parish. The rector brought up the concept of investing. He urged us to consider investing in multifaceted ways. How we invest in our personal lives, how we as a parish invest in our community, how both of those investments contribute to a more just society. The readings today from Amos and Luke look at how we relate to money in our personal lives, in our society as a whole. Through Amos and Luke, we're given a picture of where dishonest wealth leads and God's call to bring about a more just society. Luke, through the use of a parable, asks us to look at how we relate to wealth, both spiritual and physical, and to a neighbor. Amos offers us insight into how we might approach our use of wealth. I believe our role as a church is to call attention to these injustices and then work to change them. We no longer keep our faith and our money separate. A relationship to wealth influences how we live gospel lives. We look at our relationship to wealth in three ways. Dishonest wealth in our personal lives, dishonest wealth in society more generally, and honest weight in how individuals in society use the gifts that God has provided them to create a more just society. Let's begin by looking at dishonest wealth in our personal lives. First of all, you may be wondering how we are to define dishonest wealth. How do we know when we're faced with dishonest wealth in our personal lives? In Greek, dishonest wealth can be translated as mammon of iniquity. Mammon is more than just money or wealth. It may be best described as those things we rely on in this world. This term refers partially to wealth by ill begotten gain. It's about considering one's own self-interest over and against the needs of our neighbors. But that's not all it means. It seems to be also about the bigger picture. It's more about the path money and wealth can take us down, rather than the things themselves. It's not the money or the wealth that's evil in any way. It's the corruption and temptations that can lead us to our desire for money and wealth. It's our allegiance and reliance on wealth instead of God. Finally, these iniquities permeate the societies of the world, especially in relationship to wealth and money. As a result, this leads to an unjust system permeated by dishonest wealth. Now that we understand what we mean by our dishonest wealth, let's look at today's parable in Luke, see how dishonest wealth is at play in the story. In today's parable, see the self-interest is the driving force and motivation behind the manager's actions. The manager had allegedly been squandering. This man, his employer, was angered to find out he'd been stealing. He planned on firing the manager. The manager now has to think quickly in order to survive. The consequences of losing his position are dire. He doesn't have the physical strength to work in the fields in order to beg. He won't last long. So he thinks quickly. He calls in those he owes debts to his boss. He reduces their debts. Why? He hopes that he can be treated with compassion and empathy. And somehow his plan works, and his master commends him. Looks like he's on the road to getting his job back. Ultimately, even if it was all in his own self-interest, he chooses relationships over greed. We don't get to see if this guy changes or if he goes back to business as usual. I like to think this is the first small pivot point to a major shift in the way this guy sees the world. I can think he's becoming more compassionate. But we don't know, and that's not the point of this parable. The point is that you can't serve your own greed and your neighbor simultaneously. It's only when he stops serving his own greed for a second that he's freed up to serve his neighbor. 
Let's take a step back for a second to see the bigger picture. It can be confusing to understand why the manager is commended to his boss. By his boss, throughout Luke's gospel, there's an emphasis on God's mercy, the reversal of fortune that comes with the kingdom of God. For example, in Luke's gospel, we get the Magnificat. In addition, Luke's gospel emphasizes Jesus' concern for the poor. So in this context, we see that shrewdness is commended because it is an act of compassion to those who are poor and suffering. It's a step in the direction of refraining from what, making wealth the goal of one's life. It's about giving value to what's truly valuable. Because this old MasterCard commercial, commercial with this, for example, like, cost of new boots, $80, cost of coat, $100, cost of sled, $40. Playing this notion with your kids, priceless. So recognizing and assigning value to what's truly valuable. The lesson for us is for how we serve the poor, to act mercifully and compassionately with the concerns of others in mind. It's how we serve others rather than the reckless pursuit of wealth for wealth's sake. Not stepping away from the attitude of by any means necessary by think, kind of thinking, keeping in mind the goal of creating a more just society at all times. It's about seeing service to neighbor and justice as the end goal rather than power and wealth. So wrestling with the questions of, as a community of the struggles of our personal relationship to wealth. It's about asking hard questions. Questions of how much is enough? How much should we give away? How can we raise our children to be both wise and generous? If we ever feel secure in how much we have, we always be left wanting more. The parable from Luke the struggles of the manager poses these questions for us to relate to wealth and more. That's us to take a look more deeply into our own lives in an honest way, see where we are serving wealth, where we are serving neighbor. But as Luke looks at the problem of humans' relationship to wealth on a personal level, Amos looks kind of at a more societal level. Reading from Amos looks at practices in the marketplace that lead to dishonest wealth, so self over and against one's neighbor. This for Amos is an act of injustice. It was antithetical to the call of the people of Israel to do justice. To get a better, better understanding of why Amos was angered by the actions of the people, we need to understand the context better. Angus, Am Amos is angry because the implicit call to justice, follow, follow God. Justice in, in this case is the ordering of society in order that more life can thrive. Let's look at the practices that Amos lists to better understand where they went wrong. Amos isn't against marketplaces. He's angered about practices that create untrustworthy markets, showing them how they've lost their way. They aren't serving the needs of those they've been called to serve by God. Saying these practices need to change in order to create social prosperity and fair means of exchange. Amos brings up the ephah and the shekel, both of which are units of measure. Units of measure were not standardized, so they vary by region. So a marker is to take advantage of others and cheat them by not using the correct unit of measure. This would especially prey on the poor and illiterate. This is not okay. These are the very people who require special care and concern, so to cheat them is an act of injustice. Amos goes on to condemn those who yearn for the end of the Sabbath day in this passage. They yearn for the end of the Sabbath day because the Sabbath day is a day of rest for all. It's a skill in the Jewish tradition. The Sabbath day was a day of justice. They couldn't cheat their neighbor on Sabbath day. Thus, they yearned for the end of Sabbath day so they could go back to cheating. They were serving greed rather than their neighbor. Also, in Amos' day, the sense of justice and laws had been lost. The line about buying poor to silver referred to the practices of enslaving those in debt. Even those entire worldly possessions amounted to a pair of sandals. This too is a case of injustice in the system. The passage also mentions the selling of the sweeping of wheat. They think, well, that, what's so bad about that? They're conserving resources and selling all they can. It doesn't sound so bad. The problem is that those sweepings of the wheat were reserved for the poor. Remember how the Hebrew Testament and Luke and Jesus really have a thing about how we treat the poor? So in selling those sweepings of wheat, they were denying those in need the food they needed to survive. They were serving their own greed and self-interest rather than the needs of their neighbors. 
In this book, Sufi's Everyday Examples of How We Anticipate Resistance that Are Dishonest, It Leads to Injustice and Calls to Attention. He's pointing out the ways we need to change, showing concrete ways that society is unjust, how we participate in it, and how we are to change. All these are equal measures of literal nature. The ephah and the shekel, the buying poor to silver, the selling of sweeping of wheat, allows iniquity to flourish. Concerns of Amos should also be our concern. We as persons or as a parish invest in a way that gives more to others than to some, that obscures those who have less while benefiting those who have more, participating in society that benefits some, but creating a culture of injustice. This is one way that dishonest wealth can affect the system as a whole. Well, how we spend our money, what stores we shop at, who we invest in, are all part of that. It's about placing value in what's truly valuable. Environmental economics just illustrates this well. Where the beauty and resources of the earth are put into an equation. They're put into a cost-benefit analysis as a business transaction. Something simply cannot be quantified. The earth's beauty is one of those things. Human need and suffering are another. We can't stick it into an equation. We can't put it into a cost-benefit analysis. That's not the way kingdom economics works. Kingdom economics places value on all life, beyond any drive for wealth and money. If it were an equation, all lives would always outweigh any financial gain. I think we now have a sense how dishonest wealth operates in our personal lives and society writ large. What then can provide a corrective of this dishonesty? Simply put, honest weight. How can we individually and collectively use the gifts we have been given to serve others? First, let's define honest weight in contrast to dishonest wealth. By honest weight, I mean placing value on what's valuable. It's about being guided by the principles of justice in the Old Testament. Also, it's about the values of the kingdom to be merciful and to serve the poor. It's about the choice of guiding our actions based on empathy, rather than self-interest alone. Money needs to flow, it cannot stagnate. To understand money better, it needs to flow. Eric Law, an Episcopal priest and educator, designed an activity. In this, in this exercise, everyone has money, and you've got to walk around the room. Every time you meet someone, if they have less than you, You've got to give some of your money to them. Sometimes there's a lot of money being passed back and forth, a lot of relationship with others, and a bit of laughter as we're all trying to give it away as fast as we can. I found that when I participated in this activity, I found ourselves being open and generous and always giving away a lot of our money to each person we met. We were never without money, for as long as others were always passing along. When money stockpiles in the hands of the few, as it does in our country, injustice happens. Justice happens because much of our society cannot thrive, only a few can. It values the needs of a few over the needs of all. The creation of a just society requires a free flow of money, generosity for more people to thrive. I participated in another short exercise to understand money's value in itself. All participants were given a dollar and we had to describe what a dollar is to someone so they'd never seen money before. This exercise also ended in a fair bit of laughter. We used the fact that these little green pieces of paper are given so much value in themselves, when in fact they are only worth the value we give to them. Money holds power because we've given it that. What if we were to give generosity the power of money, compassion the power over money, empathy the power over money? What if we were to give relationships to each other over the power of money? How would our world be different? We give money its honest weight to see it for what it is, little green pieces of paper that are transactional in nature. They're meant to be given and to be received. And they're never meant to stay in one place. In a more everyday sense, it's about where we choose to spend our money. It's about the companies we support by shopping at them. To put it simply, we vote with our money. We spend a dollar on a local business that puts money back to the economy. We're creating and serving others and not wealth. When we spend our money at companies that do not treat their employees well, or perpetuate harm to the environment or people, we're participating in a system that perpetuates injustice. For example, 18 years ago, I chose to become a vegetarian. I became aware of the poor treatment of both the animals and the people. I chose not to support this entity by not spending money on it. Another example on a larger scale, the stories of those who have chosen to boycott a company. I used them from ethical and moral objections to led them to refuse to support them. These examples barely scratch the surface. Each of you brings your own gifts. There are many ways to look at our relationships personally and as a community to wealth. 
This shows us what happens when focus our focus is only on self-interest. It shows us what happens when we serve our neighbor. Amos points out that the market can be dishonest, the people can serve themselves instead of the needs of justice. Finally, we look at the ways that we can look honestly and deeply at the questions of our relationship to wealth, ways that we can use our gifts to create a more just society. Recall the story I told you earlier, the one about my work at the poor parish in San Francisco. Turns out that we had our money invested in a bank, which was known to support the prison industrial complex. In the interest of justice, we as a parish decided to invest elsewhere. It wasn't a hard decision, because it was the right decision. Amen. Oh,